uh, let's say I've been honored to be here on board with the other distinguished uh, per, uh, Professor Urbanovitz and uh, um, Colonel Vargas. And uh, many times we've been over in the last couple of weeks uh, talking about the same subject, but uh, um, how many ways can you describe a place and still learn something new? Um, so uh, as I say, redundancy is the, the aid to memory in the redundancy department. But uh, I'm going to talk about Hawaii today just because uh, uh, it is always an interesting world we are in, and especially if you've been there before, or you have lived there, which I have done before, uh, or you're visiting it for the first time. So much of this you may be quite familiar with. Um, but on the other hand, there's uh, whatever topic, there's always something else that is a surprise, just like we had this morning's talk, first about, about World War II, which is a, a rather gripping subject of which Hawaii was in the center of the war for the Pacific. But I'm not going to go into that fact too much, except that Hawaii has survived in spite of the troubles of the world and, um, and may it long live. Uh, my title here is uh, Hawaii no Ka'oi, which is just Hawaii is the best. And in the local language, it's uh, Hawaii. There's always an extra consonant on it. Um, and my family has been um, coming and going there for many generations. First of all, my middle name is Perry, so Commodore Perry stopped in Hawaii before he was stationed in China, before he went to open up Japan. And then my own grandparents, both my grandfathers were career army officers, and they were both um, stationed in Hawaii in the 1920s. And my own parents met as school children in Hawaii. Subsequently, they moved to Japan in the occupation. And, um, but it, what, what it means is that um, I lived in Hawaii for a year when I was a child, but I also had a lot of family and friends there. So even though I'm not a native Hawaiian, I have this feeling that it's one of my home states. And of course, you know, we're out here in the great, great Moana, the great blue ocean. And we've seen plenty of it already. But these islands are perhaps the, the most um, in a sense, dramatic, because the big island of Hawaii is the world's biggest mountain. We've heard this from other uh, sources. And then there's this 1,500-mile chain of islands that spreads out into the northwest of the Pacific, uh, so that the main islands are just the what's called the Windward Islands, and the Leeward Islands up farther, they are atolls and spits and small bits and pieces of islands, which are now mostly a marine preserve. But again, we are going to the Kona Kosh right on the Big Island, which is, as you well know, still the active volcano. And if you go to the eastern shore, southeastern shore particularly, you can see the lava pouring into the ocean. And uh, Mauna Kea, the great um, mountain, is often snow-capped. So only in Hawaii can you go skiing on one day and then go all the way down to the beach. And so this is a a very dramatic landscape. Then the other islands going up to uh, Maui, Molokai, Oahu, Kauai, and of course this itinerary is quite wonderful because you get to go stopping at more places than you would probably get to do on a uh, on land-based vacation. Though, of course, the transport is pretty good around it, except it's not by sea. There's no more inner island uh, public shipping, which is hard to believe because this is an ocean world and there was always a boat going to the next island. Now even the, uh, the ferry services have ended because the airplanes are so quick and relatively inexpensive. And so people are flying around unless you happen to be uh, paddling. Well, anyway, we're going here to Kona Coast. And then we'll be go, go up to Honolulu in Oahu, and then the other Lanai, and then Kauai, Maui. Uh, I. Um, I unfortunately am getting off in Honolulu to go stay with some family, but uh, uh, you get to see plenty of the Hawaiian Islands, just like we saw quite a bit of French Polynesia. But you know, these are the famous quotes of Mark Twain, the fairest islands to have ever been anchored in an ocean, or James Michener, if paradise consists solely of beauty, then these islands are the fairest that man ever invaded, for the land and sea were beautiful and the climate was congenial. And <coughs> this is the fate of Hawaii that humans came, first of all, in the great Polynesian emigration, and then everybody else has been coming since. Now, I've been 
to Hawaii ever since I was a kid. Once I brought my sailing kayak and sailed from the Big Island to Maui, Molokai to Oahu over about a month time. And, and if you think the sea is big, it's especially big if you're taking this cruise ship. Well, I showed this the other day that I once got flipped off the Molokai. And uh, so I have, let's say, tasted the wild waters of Hawaii from a, a few feet under even. And so I'm always happy to come back to see the different islands, see how things are changing. Now, the, the biggest pro uh, complaint in Hawaii is, is getting overdeveloped, but actually it is still a beautiful and fairly relaxed place. I don't need to go into all of the different things you'll be seeing or can experience for yourself, but it goes from the beaches up into the higher mountains. This is Kauai with the great uh, cliffs and canyons. Then there are little atolls and uh, places that are far away and you cannot uh, go there except by some private means, particularly up in the marine preserve. So this is Kure Island, which is the most northwestern of all the Hawaiian islands and is part of the, um, well, first of all, there's a listening post and there's always been a military presence out there as in Midway Island further out. But there's also a lot of wildlife that is now under pr protection out there to essentially provide refuge for the bird life and the, and the sea life that is threatened in so much of the other areas of the Pacific. And so that's a, a, a real change in our attitude toward all these islands that we realize that they actually should have a modicum of protection so they don't get overdeveloped. So most of the development, of course, is concentrated in the, the bigger islands where people have always been. So, in a short list, the old name for Hawaii was the land of raging fire because you could see it from sea, the glow on the horizon of the erupting volcanoes, which uh, they don't have any in, for instance, French Polynesia now. They have some in Tonga. But the first settlers came up from the Marquesas in a couple of waves of voyaging canoes. And then they settled the different islands and uh, there was a lot of conflict between on each island and between the islands until King Kamehameha uh, united the islands and made a full, let's say, uh, confederated kingdom out of all of these islands. Then Captain Cook came in 1779 and was sh uh, for shortly followed by all the whalers and the planters and the, the cowboys and the... Uh, and this led to the rapid decline of the native population, which was estimated maybe 400,000 or more, and it came down to maybe 35,000 um, at its native. Now it's considered that um, there's at least 40 to 50,000 purebred Hawaiians still in the islands, but there's so much more, 10 times that of uh, what they call hapa, I mean mixed uh, blood, either European, Asian, with the Hawaiians, and so Hawaii has ended up being the most diverse place, at least in the United States, where there is no racial majority. In fact, most people are of mixed ancestry. Um, and then, uh, I'll, I'll go into the story a little bit later, the annexation by the U.S. 1898, a more immigration, especially from uh, the Philippines, Japan, China. Then we know the story of Pearl Harbor, and then after the war, um, Hawaii became a great tourist destination, especially after the jet plane came and brought uh, now millions of people in the season. And this has led to a lot of development, problems with the water, problems with the um, forest cover, invasive species. There's a whole long laundry list of trouble that all of this development and prosperity and people have caused. And most recently, the Akaka bill, Senator Daniel Akaka, tried to redress the grievances to the native Hawaiians and give them status along with other um, Native Americans. And that's still an argument. And most recently it was uh, uh, George Bush, uh, uh, W. Bush, who set up the Hawaiian marine protection sanctuaries out in the northwestern uh, islands. So this is a, a sketch of it all, but uh, the first people who came here came this way. And that's uh, something I talked about earlier, how did they navigate? Where, how did they find this land in this vast ocean? You can imagine we're sort of uh, charging along day after day, and, but you can imagine being out there in an open boat for months or even years uh, with supplies and then looking for land. And so this is the great mystery of why did the Polynesians go so far? And they found 
uh, archaeological evidence of settlements all the way out to the far northwestern islands. And so, again, there may have been far more Polynesians. It was more populous in some places back a few hundred years ago than it is now. Well, these are drawings of Herbert Cain, who's a sort of a Hawaiian um, uh, artist who tries to depict historical scenes of when there was the, the village and then the, the beach and then up the mountain, mountainside. So the, the different uh, settlements would always include the ocean and the mountains and then the agricultural land in between. When the islands were unified, this uh, was done with some brutal warfare, but then it set up uh, a, a, a larger kingdom with a more, uh, let's say, developed uh, social structure that became the government of, of Hawaii for the centuries until it was uh, annexed, and the royalty is now uh, still an issue. But King Kamehameha led battles in Maui, the big island in Oahu, and the final a uh, great battle was on the Nuuanu Cliffs where on the windward shore of Oahu they drove thousands of other uh, enemies over the cliffs and this is uh, a very dramatic place. You can get, go up on the Pali Highway and go see this but they don't let you jump off anymore. And uh, so this was a kind of a warlike uh, culture here and very much a class structure with the Ali'i nobles, the king, the local and then Kamehameha and then um, merchants, artisans, slaves, and like the rest of Polynesia, it was depending on the size of the island, the structure socially would get more uh, complicated as uh, Professor Ivanovich was talking about. But uh, look at these old illustrations. How about that for a tattoo on his uh, left leg there? And so these were pretty dramatic uh, people, as dramatic as maybe the, uh, the, the European sailors who came in, but um, and I talked about Captain Cook and his uh, demise on the beach near Kona where we're going. But uh, when the Europeans came, the Polynesians were pretty strong, I mean the Hawaiians I should say, were a very strong culture with strong leadership. They were fairly prosperous because the land is so uh, productive. And they were had of these beautiful elaborate robes and ceremonies and a, and a deep spiritual following called Hana where they did have uh, deities for the sky and the sea and numerous uh, idolatry, uh, let's say. Uh, but uh, this was an intact culture until the contact. And in some ways, I uh, quote James Cook again saying, that it would have been better had we left these people just be, rather than the, the difficulties after the contact, particularly the spread of diseases which caused the great decimation of the uh, population. Now this is again Herbert Cain's uh, drawings of the the boats arriving for a ceremony at one of the great uh, heiau, the uh, ceremonial um, uh, pyramids and uh, uh, temple mounts which were quite large. This one's on the north side of Oahu. This one, uh, I'll show you the, the rocks of it in a minute, but uh, these, these drawings are sort of evocative of a whole period that maybe seem romantic but on the other hand, it's well past, and there's still uh, uh, p patent uh, nostalgia for the old times and particularly the royal family among native Hawaiians. Um, this is the Herbert uh, Kane's illustration of the building of the great uh, uh, heiau uh, pu Puanua, which is likened to some of the Mayan scale pyramids in the in the uh, in the Americas. And uh, that did, not that there was maybe contact between these peoples at such a great dis distance, but, but the um, islands are all uh, well documented with many of these large structures that have now been uh, neglected, often taken apart for building other buildings and such. So, but uh, to the native Hawaiians, they're still very sacred. Now, they don't do this anymore, which was ritual killings of enemies and or people who would break the taboo, somehow insult the nobility, something like going swimming with the royals or surfing. Uh, commoners were not allowed to associate with the nobility in that way and the punishment was death like this. But when the Europeans first came, they found you know, very elaborate uh, thatch buildings, the heiaus, these tiki gods, uh, which 
uh, seem somewhat uh, like they're laughing at us in the, uh, in the, from the past, but they were greatly feared. And the social customs of taboo, which is a Polynesian word, were enforced by uh, death often. But even you go into the Kona Coast and other places where it's not that developed, you'll see the, the, the evidence of these heiau stone structures even down on the shore. Now they are protected and documented, but you can imagine when they had elaborate tikis and carvings and ceremonial houses on it. But then came the Europeans, and James Cook led the way 1779. And at first it was, uh, well, let's say, a peaceful visit until James Cook uh, had a skirmish and he himself got killed. But after that incident, uh, people have still been coming regularly to the point where now it's a overwhelming amount of visitors coming. So this has now become the biggest industry in Hawaii is we the visitors, let's say. But these are some of the earlier scenes of, of uh, a wonder in, in the Sandwich Islands. They were originally dubbed after the, the Lord of Sandwich. But the name has reverted, of course, to the native name of Hawaii. Uh, but since those times, the visitors have now outnumbered the natives. And this is a direct contrast between French Polynesia, where the, all the islands were on the majority of the people in residence are of Polynesian heritage and uh, ethnicity, and the Europeans are visitors or else a minority. It's the other way around in Hawaii. The native Hawaiians are variously 5% perhaps in pure blood, uh, maybe 30% in mixed blood, but the majority of people are of another, another uh, background. And so the Hawaiians very much feel like they've been overwhelmed, let's say, by the rest of the world. Well, I will just continue on to say that the British uh, recognized the sovereign kingdom of Hawaii. And we may wonder that why is the British Jack, the Union Jack, on the Hawaiian flag? Now, this is Fort George, one of the settlements that was founded by the British as a stockade for trading and such. But that Hawaiian flag was actually chosen by one of the, uh, I think, Kamehameha the, the Third. He was given a Union Jack by uh, George Vancouver who was one of the officers of, of the Cook Expedition, came back a number of other times. And so it was adopted as a sort of a, a bright and colorful ensign. The stripes are the seven major islands. And so the relations with the outside world were, were, were difficult, but Hawaii had its sovereignty in the sense that the, all the European and, and the American government, the Japanese government, they all recognized the, the sovereign kingdom of Hawaii. And, uh, but the more people came, the more they liked it, the more business was set up, the plant planters began to plant the pineapple crops, and uh, more people came to live. The missionaries converted the local people to Christianity. Um, and as Noe was saying, they all got their mumu, so they don't even show much of their neck in that era, the Victorian. Uh, prohibitions came in on the dancing, and uh, there was a period where Hawaiian culture was e eclipsed by the European influences and the American influences, say. And uh, that's still somewhat true, but the, there's been a considerable revival of the native culture after, let's say, the, uh, the shock of contact with the rest of the world. Well, the king, Kamehameha, who united his family continued in uh, the, the monarchy. I mean, it was an absolute monarchy. It finally had a, a local parliament. And then they had the royal palace that they built. This is mid-1800s, the Iolani Palace, which is still there in downtown Honolulu. And that's where the kings and the queens would live and hold court. Um, it's right near the state legislature now, which is a very modernist building. But this is still the focal point for the, particularly the the um, native Hawaiian allegiance to their tradition and their heritage, so it's the site of many events. And uh, this was the previous flag of the, of, the, of the royalty and the royal crest. And the Hawaiian uh, royalty very much took on all the European trappings. Um, and many were sent to Europe to be trained, learn their English, learn their French, et cetera, came back to Hawaii. And they felt that they were uh, equal among other sovereigns around the world. 
Uh, so this was, uh, let's say, a, a heritage which uh, continues to this day in the minds of many native um, Hawaiians. So there was the, the lineage of the Kamehamehas, other kings, Kalakua, uh, into the late 1890s. And this was the last queen, Lili Okealani. And as a young woman, she was trained in England and let's say was a proper Victorian princess and then adowned with her medals and sashes and gowns. So you can imagine going to Honolulu back uh, over 100 years ago and you would see a functional royalty. Now, uh, this is, seems like a long time ago, but actually historically it's not, not all that long ago. Um, but uh, at the time, the missionaries and the planters and everybody else coming into uh, Hawaii created a lot of um, discontent with the absolutist royalty. Now this was, of course, for Americans, this was a difficult fit, let's say. But Leo Kanani was most famous because she wrote the great song, Aloha Oi, and uh, you can hear it all the time. But she was a you know accomplished musician and a composer in addition to being the queen. And so the court life, though, was very much disrupted by the agitation of particularly the planters. And uh, Sanford Dole of Dole Pineapple led a uh, parliamentary uh, coup d'etat that declared a republic and the royalty was not to be uh, in charge anymore. And there was a counterpart of American and also British uh, Navy that came in and landed. These are U.S. Marines being landed in 1893 um, to make sure that foreign interests were protected and there would not be uh, civil strife. And it was actually not a very violent uh, uprising, let's say. The, the uh, queen was arrested by the new provisional government and charged with sedition in her own country. So you can imagine what that would be like in some other royalties. Well, this is the fate of monarchy, perhaps, if it does not compromise with the modern situation and often is out of a job. So this is an appeal of the... Uh, Lily Leo Kalani, who said, Oh, honest Americans, as Christians hear me for my drown downtrodden people, their form of government is as dear to them as yours is as precious to you. And we quite warmly love our country as, as you do yours. And with all your goodly possessions co covering a territory so immense that there yet remain parts unexplored, possessing islands that although new at hand, had to be neutral ground in the time of war, do not covet the little vineyard. And it goes on and finally says, uh, we hope that God will keep his promise and will listen to the voices of the Hawaiian children lamenting for their homes. Well, she was released from jail and retired and uh, spent out her days. She actually had no children, so there's a remnant of the royalty still uh, in Hawaii, and there's some allegiance to uh, the descendants of Kamehameha to this day, though they're not in political uh, form these days, because in a sense the royalty is uh, in, in control of a government is, is quite passe around the world. But here's another royal that had trouble, the Queen of Spain in the 1890s with rebel, rebels arising in Cuba and uh, the Philippines, and then of course the Spanish-American War put an end to all of the Spanish Empire, and so the United States in its, uh, let's say, imperial way um, had its battles in the Manila and in Cuba and Puerto Rico, and Hawaii was sort of in this era of uh, expansion. So here's an illustration that shows the United States in the early days being small, and now it's spread from ocean to ocean. Now, right or wrong, that's what happened, and uh, this is still a a bit of a debate in Hawaii as to whether this should have happened at all or what, what, what should be done about it. Now, the, I'll just show you some more illustrations of, this is uh, President McKinley offering up new territory for the Uncle Sam's dinner, including Puerto Rico and the Philippines. Sandwich Islands actually refers to, uh, of course, Hawaii. But here's another point of why this happened, because then the competitive powers of the time they were most worried about Japan. And then you see this, why does this strange hound follow me everywhere? He smells the sausage, Uncle, and the sausage is Hawaii in the pocket of Uncle Sam. So this was perhaps the compelling reason why the annexation happened. 
even if they were local business interests that wanted to, you know, let's say, run the show. But otherwise, Japan very likely could have come over and just taken Hawaii away from the leadership. So, of course, then it went on from there. But a lot of this was also very jingoistic and uh, downright racist, where the Hawaiians were accused of mistreating the the European uh, American women and Leo uh, Lili Keolani herself was caricaturized quite brutally in the papers of the time. Here she is on a seesaw over a sugar barrel with, playing with Uncle Sam. Um, or when the US government had a what they call the Blount Commission that would try to figure out whether this was legal or what was right. Those who wanted to restore Leo Keolani to her throne so that it's actually impossible because there's too many opponents in Hawaii. And here's another terrible cartoon of her trying to pawn her crown. How much will you lend me for this Honolulu crown? And he says, I, have, I might have let you, let, lent you a few sandwiches a month ago, but it isn't worth the wisp of hay now. And so this was, a, let's say, a shotgun wedding with the United States, and the reluctant bridegroom and the maiden were let's say, forced into a uh, union, and so then Hawaii became a territory. Uh, and, the, and the United States, of course, now had more kids at the dinner table, including Cuba, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii. So this is uh, just what happened. Meanwhile, back in Hawaii, there was a group of business and also um, Hawaiian community leaders that formed a patriotic league to oppose the annexation and to uh, lobby Congress and the President to um, you know, cancel this annexation, which did not happen. And meanwhile, it, back in the mainland, this was the triumph of, uh, of the day, as expressed in this uh, song. And uh, of course, Hawaii continued on uh, in its own beauty and its own economy, quite removed from most of the mainland. But then it became with through shipping and now through air transport integrated into the American economy and then the world economy. And then it had its own cultural transformation, particularly in the musical sphere, that uh, Hawaiian music became quite popular. And uh, our distinguished musicians on board will uh, show you more about that. It became a mainstream uh, popular music around the world, and uh, the, the Hawaiian bands would go on tour all over. And you can hear it today as a expression of, say, modern Hawaiian culture. But back then it was considered very exotic, of course, when it was first new and brought over. Uh, meanwhile, the economy was largely transformed to become an agricultural economy with pineapples and coffee we'll have in Kona and different other products. Much of that has declined just because the global economy has meant that the price of labor is cheaper almost anywhere else than in Hawaii. And then tourism came in, especially when airplanes started arriving. Um, this was the way you used to come here. On a ship, you'd have a week or more of ship life. And then when you got there, you really felt like you got there. Nowadays, people just sort of drop out of the sky and then leave quickly. 1959 is when Hawaii became a full-fledged state. And uh, so this sort of capped off that whole transitional period. And now Hawaii is one of the 50 states and uh, Hawaii has its representation and its due in Washington. So uh, now just to show you a little bit more of the places you've probably already been, but we'll be landing in Kona, right here on the Big Island. And if we have time, you go up to Waimea or Hilo or on the other side, the volcanoes. There's a lot to see. People come just to one island and spend weeks at a time just to see what they have or they have a home there. And uh, the Big Island is particularly dramatic because of the great mountain Mauna Kea and the volcan volcanic activity. Uh, I was there a number of years ago hiking over one place with my family, and now it's completely covered with lava and it's a no-go zone. So these are this is very much the island that is alive with geothermal activity. And I have a friend in Oahu who's with, who's with the, the U.S. Geodesic Service, and he spends his time monitoring this volcano uh, just to make sure people will evacuate in time before this happens again. You know, this is a, uh, the living earth in, in action here, but it makes it a very dramatic place to visit. Then the next island over is Maui. 
um, which is more developed, but it has the beautiful volcan volcano of uh, Haleakala, which is dormant these days, and then all the different other beaches and sites. Uh, uh, Kahualawe is, is a, was, was a U.S. Navy uh, reserve where they practice aerial bombardment, so that's an issue with the locals, whether it should be returned to better purposes. Then we have Molokai, um, Lanai, the ships going to Lanai, which has been was was a big dole pineapple plantation. That's been opened up as with golf courses and other facilities for people to come visit. And then Kauai is on the other side of Oahu, and again the ship will be going there to Lihue and have a day going around uh, Kauai, which is very dramatic as it has the Grand Canyon of um, of Hawaii, which is this deep valley that is reminiscent of the canyon in Arizona. And then beyond that, you get up to the, the more extensive marine reserve, the Papahanaokomokuakea. Now, we can all say that together. Well, maybe later. It's, uh, it's actually descriptive of the, the chain of islands in Hawaiian, but that is probably one of the largest marine protected areas in the world now, just to make sure that this ocean will still be healthy, keep the toll from being taken. But then we're going to go from Kona to Honolulu, and this is a, on the island of Oahu, which was the traditional gathering place and the capital for both the royalty and now the current state government. And um, Oahu has its own charms, particularly you have on the leeward side, the quieter, the drier side on the south, you have the big city of Honolulu, you have Pearl Harbor, um, Waikiki Beach, etc. And then on the north side, um, Kaneohe, Kailua, Waimanalo. I used to live in Waimanalo, which is actually a, a native homeland area that was given to the um, uh, native Hawaiians as their exclusive zone. Um, my cousin was married to a native Hawaiian, so I was allowed in and became part of a Ohana a family group there to this day. And then you go up to the north side, the north shore, uh, that's where the great surfing uh, is, up at uh, uh, Halea. And so I, if you were here this morning, you see it on TV, uh, Noe gave a great talk about surfing culture in Hawaii. Oh, here it is, Haleoa. That's where surfers go to their, uh, do their worship of the waves. And then in, um, we were going to be docking in downtown Honolulu, and um, the airport's out there on that landfill. Pearl Harbor's on to the, to the west, you see on the left-hand side. And uh, then downtown you have a, uh, it's sort of cut with great freeways, and this is where many people who are long-term Hawaiians say, oh, no, now Hawaii, uh, Honolulu is sliced apart by f uh, big roads sort of like Los Angeles or anywhere USA, and you can't get around town without a car anymore. Then it goes up into the valleys that are residential. The Diamond Head on the lower right-hand side is the old volcano with the punch bowl and the World War II um, cemetery. And uh, so the, it's a very, um, not so vast, but it is uh, very, uh, let's say, packed in with uh, things to see. And you can walk around the downtown. We'll be near here, the Aloha Tower, which used to be the biggest in the in the city now, there's many big new residential office buildings all over. This is a ship you may see here, the Falls of Clyde. That's one of the last of the clipper ships that ended up in Hawaii. It was built in Glasgow, Scotland, and for lack of funding to restore it, um, the Scottish government is coming to pick it up and take it home to Glasgow. It may, it may be gone by now, but uh, that's a remnant of the age of sail. And so you have now these problems in all the beauty of Hawaii, you have the, the difficulty of earning a living. And as, I, as I, I list here, the biggest industry now is tourism in its many forms. Agriculture, which has been fading away as the major crops have been replaced by housing developments and highways and such and uh, competition from overseas. And then the military. It's a major, uh, of course, Navy base and Army and other activity around uh, Hawaii that makes it a, a preferred uh, stationing for many military personnel, but it all means that there's high costs and very low wages, so that uh, if you're a young Hawaiian, you often can't afford any home. And uh, 
the, the costs, particularly in the cities, is just too high for most people, and there's no more land. It's an island economy, so, so the costs of, of everything are, in, are higher than what we're used to in, in many other places, let's say. And so that main issue in Hawaii is always the development pressure. Where is the, uh, the, the next hotel going, the next uh, resort going to take up a beach? So if you haven't seen that movie called The Promise, it's about a Hawaiian family debating and fighting amongst themselves about their land and whether they should sell it. Uh, and similarly, the historic preservation is a problem because often the, the remains of the temple mounts, the hail of the native people are either bulldozed or they're um, forgotten in the, in the development pressure. And also the environmental problems of uh, uh, invasive species and or pesticides run off into the ocean and protection of the coral reefs and things like this are always an issue. And as I said, the Hawaiian, the state of Hawaii, depending on where you are, which island, it's, uh, there's no majority. Nobody is a overwhelming uh, presence except for the almighty dollar, perhaps. And so even here, you can see you have uh, naval officers um, being given that honorary uh, malale, and then they are there to have a blessing from a native um, spiritual uh, leader, and so this is where cultures truly mix, if not meld, in Hawaii. In some ways, it makes a, for a, always a, a, uh, an interesting place to be. And I, I, uh, I'm going to read you a limerick which I just wrote, and I'll, I'll translate a bit of it. Um, Howley is a outsider, and a uh, Wahini is a native woman. And so here's my, my target. There once was a Haole in Hawaii who adored a local Waihini. She delicately demurred as he politely reassured that his affections were purely platoniki. That's about as racy as it gets. Anyway. But what have we been hearing quite a bit about is the uh, let's say the Hawaiian cultural revival, and uh, it it is even for us Haoles who are here, we will never quite become what they call Kanaka Maoli, a real true native. Uh, but you can always share the culture, and many people who are particularly of mixed ancestry, like my family in Hawaii, are very keen on music, uh, the hula schools. They're teaching Hawaiian language again. At the University of Hawaii, they have elementary schools that are in Hawaiian, and then they also learn English or other languages. So uh, people become adept in, let's say, the culture that might have disappeared. And even the uh, religious practices of blessings and prayers, sort of mixed with maybe some Christianity, they, they go on. And so I put the question, uh, what is or whose is this aloha spirit? And as you will experience, uh, the Hawaiian people in general, from wherever they were, they do share a certain openness and kindness and courtesy above all, and a certain pace of life, uh, I think it's called holo holo. They say you just have to relax and enjoy it. And um, I mentioned before there was a talk in particularly French Polynesia about the Polynesians getting together and declaring their independence from their, uh, let's say, global uh, associates. American, Hawaii, French, Polynesia, New Zealand, and the Maoris. And the, but as you can see on this trip, Polynesia is so vast that uh, it's not going to congeal as some sort of a political state on its own. It is already well enough where it is with what is going on now. So I don't think that it'll ever come to a point of having a sovereign Hawaii. Uh, but then the culture is very strong, and even in French Polynesia and, of course, the Maori and others and all these other islands, they are very proud of their traditions and their dances and their music. And so, in a sense, that's, uh, that's well enough because we don't really have to go through any political conflicts, particularly in Hawaii where the native Hawaiians are a distinct minority in their own land. But this, for instance, is an example of how the tradition of the royalty is still remembered and honored by this is the Kamehameha Society of Native Hawaiians who, who gather and remember together and have their noble capes that we were originally were all made of 
bird feathers. These are probably not, uh, but that, that uh, red and yellow are the symbols of the Hawaiian royalty. And I think as Charlie said, it may have come from actually Spanish uh, colors back in early contact days. And uh, the, the Hawaiian culture comes back uh, almost uh, like a phoenix of uh, memory or else recreated by particularly visual artists, musical artists. So I'm just going to show you a few pictures of, uh, of the spiritual um, attempts to revive some of the ancestral feelings and underwater spirits. Uh, uh, so you'll see this on the murals in, around Hawaii and of course a lot of the, uh, the imagery that you get in the uh, song and dance. And so this is very much a uh, come with a palpable sense of that we were here for a thousand or more years, and now we all get to share it. But watch out for the goddess Pele of the volcano. And the old uh, story is you never take a stone from one of the volcanoes home because it's bad luck to the point where you have to send it back. Otherwise, Pele will be uh, angry. And so this is a sort of a visual imagination of things that were deeply held religious beliefs by the, by the people. And it, it's sort of coming back if it's um, not really well documented or, or, or very well known. But there has been a movement in the last couple of decades to uh, reestablish the monarchy or at least the sovereignty of Hawaii, which is, a, uh, I would say, it's an issue that never can quite go too far, except that there's always a flashpoint over something or other. And the, their symbol is the upside down flag of the state. Uh, but that flag itself is sort of provocative. And you see here that says, no to the Akaka bill. Now this is where Senator Daniel Akaka from Hawaii proposed in the Senate a reconciliation and giving um, equal status to the native Hawaiians as is given to the, the native Americans on the mainland. Uh, but the Hawaiians objected said, no, we were a, a sophisticated functioning kingdom and we were taken into the American fold without any treaty, without any compensation. The royal lands were all confiscated and devolved to the state of Hawaii. And so if you, if you, uh, if you listen to some of the more radical elements, they want to get everybody out of Hawaii that's not native Hawaiian, which is completely a fantasy because uh, the world is uh, different, let's say. And uh, the Akaka bill passed over the objection of some of the uh, more nativist Hawaiians. Now this is the flag that they have now taken on, not the royal flag, but, but this symbol of Hawaii, which includes the paddle and the, the, the centerpiece is actually a feather um, emblem of authority from royal times. And most recently they've been building a larger astronomical observatory on the top of uh, Mauna Kea uh, mountain in the Big Island and native Hawaiian protesters blocked the construction and claimed that it was a desecration of the holy mountain and I don't think it's been resolved quite yet. They've, they're still trying to work that out but it's in a way complete contradiction. How can you have an ancient spiritual culture saying no to a modern scientific international uh, cooperation. But we'll see how that works out. Uh, meanwhile, in Hawaii, as I said, uh, holo holo, you just got to relax. And this is the symbol of, of, of that. It's hang loose, bro, this sort of thing. It's called a shaka. And so you'll see it around and say, oh, it's OK, no problem, sort of. Uh, uh, everybody has that as, oh, it's, it's a, it can be figured out. It will not be worth the trouble of any more conflict. So this is the, the symbol of Hawaii, that everybody can come and hola hola and sh shake, their, shake their fists. See, even the president said, no problem. The world, no problem. And I mean, uh, uh, actually, Obama is a particular uh, unusual person in many, many ways, except that he was raised for part of his life in Hawaii, and he has that kind of relaxed feeling to him. Actually, my father went to the same high school, Punahou, and so he's an example of a Hawaiian, but he's from everywhere else too, and, but he kept coming to vacation here. So uh, I'll leave, leave you with a few more 
images where you may take it easy in Hawaii. And of course, the people are so warm and welcoming. That's what is the important thing. And uh, I'll show you some more pictures just of my cousin, who was a, a, a landscape painter. Although she was born in Colorado, she came and married a, uh, a Hawaiian who happened to have a Chinese name. And um, she, uh, before her death, she published a lot of these pictures of sort of uh, technicolor views of Hawaii. And most sadly, she uh, developed our family disease called ALS, and she became paralyzed and on life support, but she kept painting. She had a studio um, in the Moana Valley, and she had assistance in the, with signals from her eyes. She was able to continue painting and even lecturing at the Art Academy about this sort of native style of painting. And until she finally passed away, and we took her ashes out in a, in a, in a canoe out in uh, Waimanalo and scattered her in the sea as she requested. But she's still visible around the islands, uh, and particularly in Honolulu, where at the airport and in big buildings in Honolulu, she has painted these uh, large murals. So the, the last thing I talk about again, I mentioned this earlier, the Hakolea, the great voyaging canoe, and this is now the new um, hero again of Hawaii because it was started in the 1970s. They rebuilt the style of canoe. They sailed to Tahiti. Um, then the last couple of years they have used the traditional Polynesian navigation techniques to sail all the way around the world. And this is uh, quite a feat. I mean the Polynesians traveled all around the Pacific, let's say, but then to go all the way around the world using these uh, techniques was uh, remarkable and they came back to a great hero's welcome just a few months ago. And on, the, on board the ship, as was the Polynesian custom, they would take a, a, a modest boulder from the home island and they put it in the, in the center forward of the great canoe and pray to it to say, we will be able to get home because our stone will help us get home. And I was aboard the the vessel in New York Harbor, and they were on their way to Panama in this open boat where they sleep on deck. Now, that gets a little cold in the, some parts of the world, but they made it all the way, and they came back to a hero's welcome. And the boat's probably right there in downtown Honolulu, uh, unless it's gone back, or back around the world or something. But it carries a certain spirit of ancient Hawaii into the modern age, into the modern welcome that we will all feel when we when we get there. And uh, so I just leave you with uh, uh, hang loose and enjoy. And Hawaii no ka'oi. Hawaii is the best. Thank you very much and have a great trip. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.